Hello, and welcome to the second in this series of videos for new beekeepers. As you can see, it's a really foul day outside, and so I've done the only sensible thing and come in here, stoked up the fire, got myself a great cup of tea, a lovely piece of cake from Carol, and I'm reading a beekeeping equipment catalogue. Now these catalogues are absolutely great, but they're full of things that a couple of weeks ago you never even knew existed, and now you feel you can't live without. So what we really want to do is have a look at the equipment you actually need, and I think you'll find it's an awful lot less than you thought. Before we move on, here's a quick health and wealth warning. This video is purely about the equipment you need to start beekeeping. But like all hobbies, there's a huge amount of stuff that you might want to acquire over the years. So it's not my fault if you find yourself on a wet morning lusting after all the shiny stuff in the beekeeping catalogue. That's just part of life's rich pattern. We're often asked our thoughts on second-hand equipment. And if you can find someone who's giving up or maybe downsizing, this can be a really good source. However, be very careful as to why somebody's actually selling. Unfortunately, second-hand beekeeping equipment is a major source of bee diseases, and some of those diseases can be active for up to 60 years. If you are buying second-hand, make sure you take all the frames out and immediately burn them. With the hives, just take a blowtorch and scorch the inside of the hives gently, and this should get rid of any disease that's in there. With polystyrene hives, you need to check the manufacturer's instructions on how to sterilise them, as the blowtorch obviously won't do the job. And so the first piece of equipment we need to look at is the bee's home or the beehive. There are many different types of hive that you can buy in the UK, but the two most popular are the WBC and the National. The WBC, as you can see, is the pretty one, and if lots of people, if they're looking to put one in a garden, go for the WBC because it's far more attractive. The WBC is the traditional Winnie the Pooh hive, and whilst it doesn't stand for Winnie's Bee Centre, but for William Brufton Carr who invented it, it's a great hive, especially for the hobbyist. One of the major advantages of the WBC is it's got the stand built in, and so you don't need to buy a separate one. The WBC, however, does have a lot more parts than the National, and therefore tends to be rather more expensive. The National is a much plainer hive and very functional, and it's the one we use more of than any other. It's cheaper than the WBC, but still very practical and a good hive, especially for the hobbyist, but many of the commercial beekeepers also use national hives. You'll notice from the pictures that both the hives are made out of wood, and we recommend wooden hives to beekeepers, and we use all wooden hives ourselves. There's a move, especially in the UK, towards polystyrene hives, and whilst they're undoubtedly lighter, warmer and cheaper, we do worry about their environmental credentials, and so we'll certainly be sticking with wood at the moment. But anything that we say about the wooden hives here applies to the polystyrene ones as well. So you can use any of this information, whether you buy wood or polystyrene. So all hives require a number of different components. One of the biggest differences between the WBC and the National is that the floor is built into the WBC stand. And so with a WBC, you don't need a separate stand. But with a National, you'll certainly need a good solid stand. The floor these days we use is called a Varroa floor. And this is a mesh floor to enable any varroa mites to fall through the mesh, and it's got a tray that slides in and out. The purpose of the tray is to be able to count the number of mites that have fallen through and decide whether treatment's required. Treatment of your beehives is something that we'll look at in another video. So the entrance block sits at the front of the floor, and it's got various sizes that you can have, a large and a small entrance. The large entrance shown here is where you'll have it during the summer when the bees are bringing back lots of pollen and nectar and wanting to get in and out of the hive very quickly. You can turn it to a smaller entrance at the beginning of the year and also at the end of the year when the bees are looking to defend the hive against wasps. The first of the boxes to go on top of the floor is known as the brood box. This is basically a giant nursery. It's a deep box with frames in that are space to enable bees to work back to back. The queen lays her eggs here and the brood develops and the new bees emerge 21 days or 24 days later. It's 21 days for a girl and 24 days for a boy. At any one time there can be a couple of thousand eggs in here and maybe over 20,000 larvae developing. And all the bees have to keep it at a specific temperature to make sure that everything works properly. On top of the brood box we've got a device known as the queen excluder. The queen excluder does exactly what it says on the tin and excludes the queen from the top boxes. 
The way in which it works is very simple. The wires are wide enough apart to allow the worker bees to go up and down, but too narrow to allow the queen into the top boxes. We like these type of queen excluders best, which are round wires, and they don't tend to damage the bees as they go through. And then on top of the queen excluder, we've got our supers. The supers are very similar to the brood box, except the frames that go in them are much shallower. And the reason for that is this is where the bees will store all the surplus honey, and these boxes get incredibly heavy. So we use much shallower boxes for the honey than for the brood box. And then on top of the supers, we've got a crown board. This is a type of ceiling. You'll notice there's two strange holes cut in it, and these are where we put our porter bee escapes, which will enable us to harvest our honey later on. And we'll see that in a later video. And so finally, we've got the roof. Two sorts of roofs, the flat roof that you see here and a pitched roof. Flat roofs are much more common on the national hives and they have the advantage that snow sits on them in the winter and provides some insulation. And also you can turn them upside down and stack other bits of equipment on them when you're doing your inspections. The pitched roof of the WBCs look a lot prettier and also the rain runs off rather faster. And so that completes the hive. You need to decide whether you want a WBC or a national and if you talk to beekeepers, they'll argue long into the night as to which one's best. In reality, they both do the job perfectly well, and so it really comes down to whether you want the pretty WBC or it's playing a friend, the national. Either way, you decide. Now we need to look at what other equipment you require over and above the hive. Before you start beekeeping, it's really important to get yourself a suit. Here we can see a full suit with a fencing type veil. Whether you go for this type of veil or the more traditional round one really doesn't matter, but you should never go anywhere near a beehive without at least a veil. When you first start, I definitely recommend that you go for a full suit rather than just a jacket, because this will give you extra confidence. The difference in price generally relates to the quality of the zips and the quality of the veil, and the more you pay, the better the quality you tend to get. The other thing to remember is always buy a suit that's slightly too big for you. That bagginess not only keeps you a little bit cooler, but also gives you extra protection from any stings that might come your way. So while we're on the subject of protection, we really need to discuss gloves. Now many new beekeepers will begin by buying these leather gauntlets, and the idea is they're so thick you can't feel any stings into the hands. And that might seem like a really great idea. Unfortunately, you're not thinking like a bee. If a bee stings you, it's a polite suggestion that you should stop doing whatever you're doing. If you can't feel it, you're going to carry on and the bees are going to sting more and more into the gloves. This is unfair on the bees. You'll end up with a very aggravated beehive, which is unpleasant for you and not fair on the bees at all. And in fact, one of my first acts as world leader is probably going to be to ban these gloves. The other problem that you've got is that the gloves can easily get dirty and they're a great way of transferring disease between one hive and another because they're almost impossible to clean. So I really wouldn't recommend them. So what we recommend that you start with are basically washing up gloves. Just get a pair of these, they're cheap, they're easy to wash, and if the worst comes to the worst, you can actually throw them away and buy another pair. The thing with them is they're sufficiently light that you can actually feel what you're doing, but they also give you protection and some confidence. So they're a really good way of starting, but certainly they're not the best. By far the best gloves to wear are these medical examination ones. Make sure you get the non-powdered ones because the bees don't like the powder. These gloves don't give you any protection at all and you might think that that's absolutely crazy, but you don't need protection from your bees. The idea is to have nice bees that you can work with bare hands. The sole purpose of the gloves once you become confident is to enable you to keep your hands clean and not get them covered in honey or propolis, which is amazingly sticky bee glue. Once you get confident, you'll be able to handle your bees without gloves, especially if you're doing any sensitive jobs like picking up a queen, which is what I'm doing here. Start. So every good housebreaker requires a jemmy, and in the case of beekeeping, it's called the hive tool. This enables you to take the hive apart without damaging it, because bees glue everything together with this amazing substance called propolis. There's various different types of hive tool. Again, it really doesn't matter what sort you buy, just the one that suits you best. This is the type I use, but as I say, whichever you prefer. And so last but by no means least, we have the smoker. Now, when people come on courses, they always say to us, they can't believe how little smoke we use on the bees. 
But don't forget this is beekeeping, not making kippers. And we need tiny amounts of smoke. The idea is just to announce our presence and disrupt the guard bees a little bit when we first open up the hive. And then you might want to use some smoke to move bees around. But very quickly as you gain in confidence, you'll use your hands to do that, which is much better for the bees. Now, one of the problems that many beekeepers have when they first start is lighting the smoker and also keeping it alight. So this is the way I do it. I always start with some torn up egg boxes. They're a really good fuel for the bottom. They light easily and they're food grade. A proper beekeeper at this stage would probably use a lighted taper, but I'm a great fan of a blowtorch. And I've always got a blowtorch with me in order to sterilize any dirty equipment. Really important at this stage to get a good fire going in the bottom. And so once you've got the egg boxes alight, just give the bellows a few puffs to start getting the fire going and then you can start putting in the fuel of your choice. Now beekeepers again will argue long and hard over fuel, but I like to use pine cones. They're free and the bees seem to like the smell and they work really well. Once you put your pine cones in, really pump those bellows, do a good impression of an old fashioned train until you've really got flames coming up at the bottom and that should keep the smoke going. The only problem you've got now is that smoke's really hot coming out of there and might have bits of soot in it as well, so we need a filter of some description. My favourite filter is damp grass and I always tear up a few pieces before I actually start lighting the smoker so I can just roll them up into a ball, pop them on top of the pine cones and then the smoke that comes out of that smoker then is completely cold and that won't upset the bees at all. And that's really how to light your smoker and that smoker then should keep going for at least a couple of hive inspections. And so that's all, that's all the equipment that you need. Of course, it's not all the equipment you'll want. So thanks for watching the video and I hope you really enjoyed it. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and also maybe subscribe to the channel. The next video is going to be a really important one. As soon as the weather improves, we're going to go out there and put the nucleus of bees into the new hive and then we can start beekeeping properly. So if you want to know when we post that, subscribe and press the bell. In the meantime, I've got cake to eat. Now today's cake is um, mincemeat and marzipan and really good it is too. A lot of people have been asking us about Carol's Cakes and on the courses we're always asked for recipes. So what we've decided to do is that for every piece of cake that I eat on a video, we're gonna put the recipe on the website. So if you want the recipes, please pop over to cotswoldbees.co.uk and you'll find all the recipes there together with the blog and other interesting areas. So until next time, thanks very much and happy cake eating.